Okay, I might be live. Sorry, I am figuring out Twitch and streaming from OBS. So I clicked live a few minutes early. I want to make sure this doesn't look completely terrible. Um, so that's what that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing. Um, hi. <laughs> okay, I'm also trying to figure out how to see chat because I want to be able to do that. Okay, I think I can see um, chat. That looks cool. Okay, I can I can see chat, which is great. Um, and I can't I'm not hearing things twice. So that's also great. I don't know why I strict specifically have headphones in because I wouldn't strictly need that for this. Okay. Hi. Hello, everyone. I'm Maddie, and I'm going to make sure that I remember to tweet out that I'm going live. So I, I hope everyone's doing well. There's still technically two minutes before I was supposed to go live. I'm just early because sometimes, sometimes you be like that. So, you know, that's very fun. Okay. Oh, yeah, look. Oh, I just get a retweet. Excellent. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Balor the Brave, that I am, in fact, live. Excellent. Sorry, I've never uh, done it. I streamed to, like, I've never streamed to Twitch while hosting it myself. Um, so what are what are we doing tonight? And who am I? Because I'm not Katie or Ben. Um, so... Uh, hi, I'm Maddie. Um, I have played and run games on this show with the, um, I did the Christmas one shot. That was, uh, where we saved, uh, Christmas, uh, from Scrooge by making him and Bob Cratchit being in a, being in a relationship together. Um, I played in Chesh's, uh, ha spooky Halloween game where I was Mitzi, uh, which is the greatest character I'll ever play in my entire life. Um, I have peaked. I cannot do better. Um, but, uh, so I usually GM, but tonight, uh, this evening team, I'm doing a little bit of everything because we are going to play some Call of Cthulhu, uh, tonight. And it is a solo Call of Cthulhu adventure. Um, it is Alone Against the Flames. I sh uh, you, you, you can see the title page. Very, uh, spooky. Um, I'm going to open up. I have a can of sparkling wine, uh, but don't worry. I have a champagne flute for it because I feel like my character is going to be very fancy and need champagne. Um, this is in fact a sparkling Riesling, but anywho, cheers. Um, so that's what we're going to do. Um, we, yeah, that's what we're going to do. We're going to, I'm just, oh, Sorry, sometimes my computer decides to not pick up my Yeti, so I'm going to make sure that that is getting picked up. Um, yes, beautiful. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so yes, this is what we're going to do. I have previewed this adventure. I tried to play it by myself before, and I had a very cool physicist character, and she died immediately by falling off a cliff. Um, so I thought it would be fun to do it with you guys. So... Uh, this Call of Cthulhu solo adventure, Alone Against the Flames, um, is, it's available for free on Chaosium. Uh, it's kind of structured like a choose your own adventure. It'll be like a make this kind of role. If you succeed, go to this number in the PDF. If you fail, go to this number, et cetera, so forth. Um, the first time I tried to play through it, I learned none of what was going on. Again, I fell off a cliff and died immediately. Um, so... Uh, another cool thing about this Alone Against the Flames adventure is that it actually walks you through character creation. Um, and so we're just going to do all of that together. Um, and I'm really excited about it. So I hope you all are too, whether you're watching this live now or sometime in the future. Um, I'm also kind of new to Call of Cthulhu. I definitely, over Christmas, like, binge watch a ton of Becca Scott um, being the keeper for a bunch of Call of Cthulhu streams. And I got really excited about the system, but could not get anyone to play with me. So I got real obsessed with their solo adventures. And I think there's there's three or four published solo adventures. Um, yes, absolutely. Becca Scott is amazing and so good at Call of Cthulhu. Um, 
So uh, hopefully we scare the bejesus out of me tonight and I get really nervous. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to cheers and that is so sweet and bubbly. I'm here for it. Okay. Um, let's get started. I don't think I'm going to show the text of the game on screen. I kind of want to read it. Um, and I don't want to spoil everything. I don't you be able to like, oh, look over in that column. It says blah. You know what I mean? So, uh, but when I have to roll dice, we will, we will do that together. Um, okay. Oh, okay. So here we go. The sun is high in the sky, a merciless ball of heat. You feel scorched by the time you reach the bus halt in front of Osborne's drugstore. It's a relief to put down your heavy case and take off your hat for a moment. You fan your face. It's been a long summer here in your hometown, and yet a curiously empty one. You look across the street at the grubby butcher's shop, the grocer's with its faded awning and the shabby tobacconist. Mistrustful faces glare at you as they pass, eyeing your clothes and luggage. It was your parents' choice to live here, not yours. I was happy down south as a child, among Providence's white-walled houses and leafy churchyards. Perhaps this new job in Arkham will supply the change I need. Yet everyone I know in the world lives here. I don't know anyone in Arkham, not one soul. And I ask myself one last time, am I doing the right thing? The answer is here. None of my supposed friends have come to see me off and I am alone. Whatever challenges lie in Arkham, it will be a new life and a brave one. A small gray motor coach approaches and rattles to a stop. I put my hat back on and pick up my cases. So if you guys were wondering, this is all written in third person, but I'm going to try to translate it in my brain and do it in first person and show off my Southern accent that I can do, which I, because I come by it honestly. In my mind, she's like from deep South. Um, okay. Anyway. And, uh, all the PC man, uh, subscriber for seven months. That's amazing. I am scrolling to get to the next thing. We go from one to 263. So we're gonna jump down here. Okay. Two young men with sullen expressions alight from the coach. One looks me up and down before heading away. The driver also steps down, glancing at me before crossing the road to visit the tobacconist. When he returns, he is rolling a cigarette between his yellowed fingers. He gives it a final twist and examines me as he reaches for his matchbox. He's a thin man in his 50s, dressed in a stained shirt with the bus company emblem. Yet his eyes are sharp in their dark sockets. Where to? I show him my ticket for Ossipee. From there, I'll connect to Rochester and Portsmouth before the coastal line to Newburyport. And finally, Arkham. I should be able to afford a rail ticket for at least some of the way. Otherwise, this will be the first of many long bus trips. Mm-hmm. The driver scratches the match and lights his cigarette. The end flares as he takes a draw. Then he exhales and gestures to the back of the coach. Luggage wraps up there. So this is the part where we're going to get into character creation. So this tells me to look at my investigator sheet at the top, and I'll show you guys the investigator sheet at the top. That's the wrong button entirely. I have too many windows. Okay. There's my blank character sheet. That's not sized like I thought it was supposed to be. Okay. Hello, friends. Uh, okay. That doesn't need to be visible. We don't need that at all. Okay. Sorry for, I'm sure this looks bonkers on y'all's end. There we go. Okay. So there's our character sheet. Um, 
At the top, I have spaces for eight characteristics, strength, constitution, power, dexterity, appearance, size, intelligence, and education. And I get to allocate values to those, um, writing in, yeah. So I get 140, 350s, 260s, a 70, and an 80. Okay, um, so let's do that. Um, let's see. I don't think she's very strong, uh, so we'll put her strength in down in 40. Um, let's see. Uh, I'll put her appearance as... Okay, let's do... I'm going to put my 80 in my power. Um, let's do that. I think, yeah. Um, cause I get 180. Yes. Okay. Um, I'll put, I'll make her pretty. We'll put a 60 in appearance, a 60 in appearance. Um, we'll do a 50 in education. I feel like she maybe didn't pay a whole lot of attention in school. Um, a 50 in con, um, it's for constitution. And as it's filling out, notice that we're doing the half of the regular value and the fifth of the regular value. That isn't going to matter for the solo adventure, but those are like, oh, it might a little bit, but that's like a hard and extreme success. So with Call of Cthulhu, we're always trying to roll under our stat. And if you get like under a fifth of your stat, you did really, really good. So I'll put a 50 in my constitution. Um, I will put... Uh, 50 in my size. So that's all my 50s. Yes. Okay. Um, so she is average size. Actually, you know what I'm going to do? Sorry. I'm going to make her below average in size. Um, so she's a little thing and we'll make her strength average. Okay. So we'll do that. Okay. So I have a 60 and a 70 left. Okay. Um, I am going to be a uh, 70 in intelligence. Um, in my mind, she's maybe like a journalist kind of character. Um, I think that's one of the occupations that's available in the like uh, quick start guide. Um, so that's kind of who I'm building. Okay, so 60 in dexterity. Beautiful. So we've allocated our scores there. Um, and... Uh, and now we get to read some more. Okay. Huzzah. Sorry, that must look weird every time I, like, look at all my tabs and come back. Anyway, I'll try to stop doing that. Okay. So, once we have done that, we're gonna go to eight, and I think we're about to get to do our first roll, so I'm excited. And, oh, I can't see chat anymore, so I wanna pop you guys up. Okay. Oh, happy birthday. Okay, so how does t uh, this do single player? Um, it does single player by, it's it's kind of set up like a choose your own adventure sort of thing. So if you like, um, it should make a little more sense as we go through. I'm looking at a PDF that's broken down, like every paragraph has a number associated with it. And it'll be like, um, once you've done with this section, go to the next number. And so I know at some point it's like, hey, if you succeed, go to this number. If you fail, go to this number. So it's not like, uh, so I think the Call of Cthulhu one, I think like, like I said at the very beginning, you might've missed it because I, I got on early because I'm kind of new to streaming by myself um, on Twitch. Um, so... Um, Oh, I, I, I started playing this adventure. I made this very cool, very me physicist character who like died immediately by falling off a cliff. So I have no idea what's going on in this adventure. Um, but I do have a basic sense of like how the gameplay works. So, okay. Uh, the driver smokes and watches as you drag your cases to the back of the motor coach. The rack is set inconveniently high on the vehicle. You get a grip on the, or I get a grip on the heavier case. 
So then it's prompting me to say, if your size is 40, go to 23. If my size is higher than that, go to 38. Well, we just set her size at 40. Okay. So we'll go to number 28. Um, okay. So yeah, excuse me, 23. I can, I can definitely read the C vein. Okay. Dedric, yes, absolutely. It's it's a module for the game that allows you to play single player, and this particular module kind of teaches you how to play as you go. Um, so um, I struggle for a few seconds with my bag before the driver comes up beside me and lends a hand, still puffing on his cigarette. Heavy bags for a small one, he remarks. You judge it best to respond with a simple thanks. Thank you. At 233. Okay. I think I'm being very dumb because I it just occurred to me that I think I can click uh yeah, I can click on the numbers and it'll jump in the PDF. I don't have to scroll the whole time. So that's fun. Okay, this will get faster then. <laughs> um, the driver flicks his cigarette into the gutter and steps into the motor coach. Its engine coughs into life. I board, grateful that I'll be the only passenger for the initial part of the trip, at least. With mixed emotions, I watch from the window as the tired avenues of my old home slip behind me receding into the distance. For a few minutes, I can still see the church spire over the brow of a low hill. Then the road dips and it too is gone. Arkham is my new home. I'll travel there and make a new start. Okay, so now we're gonna do a little more character creation. I'm gonna sip a little more of this wine. Okay, so this is saying, um, uh, you know, what? I am going to show you guys the PDF. Um, I can set that up in OBS really fast. I think this will be more fun for all of us. Um, so it, what it's going to have us do, it's, it's, the PDF is now explaining, um, the, we'll go here. Okay. It's now explaining, <coughs> um, the uh, halves, so the the hard and extreme successes. Um, so there are sometimes, <laughs> yeah, wine definitely helps build characters. Absolutely. Um, uh, this button. Heck yeah. So like the a hard success is if you roll below half of your stat. And a, an extreme success is if you roll below a fifth of your stat. Luckily, my character sheet uh, is smart and did that math for me. Um, so that's good. Oh, blank screen. Super sorry, team. Uh, can't, we're going to cancel that then. We'll just go here. Uh, hi. Hi. That's not a blank screen. Okay. I will, well, just fix that later. That's fine. <laughs> um, uh, okay. Sorry. We'll, we'll stay here for a minute. Um, I'm going to be on the character sheet, I think. Okay. So I am. Okay, so now I want to see my tracks that record sanity and magic points. So sanity, beginning sanity is equal to my original power and beginning magic points are the same value. Uh, just, you've just assigned for power divided by five. So we'll mark those on the tracks. Okay, so sanity, beginning sanity is my power. Um, beginning sanity, oh, did it fill that out for me? San oh, no. Beginning sanity is the same as my power. So I'm so sane. I've got an 80 to start with. Um, 
Hit points is nine. Okay, is that right? Uh, I hope so. It, okay. Um, and what else did it tell me? Okay. Um, beginning magic points is the same as power divided by five. Okay. Where are magic points? Magic points, 16. Beautiful. Okay. <clears throat> so, now we get to jump ahead to the next bit. All right. The coach putters through the countryside. At first, the interior is stifling and my stomach lurches with every bend in the road. However, the driver opens his window by switching seats. <sighs> However, the driver opens his window and by switching seats, I find a new spot where the breeze hits my face. I soon relax into the journey, observing the quaint little hamlets that the coach serves. A heavy set woman boards at one settlement and gives me a polite nod. She gets off at the next one. The road rises a little, passing cornfields and orchards. <sighs> okay, sorry, team. I'm kind of experimenting with this because uh, it's a new type of format, solo TTRPG stream. Um, I think since I'm reading this narration in first person, I'm going to use her voice, my character's voice. So I'm going to slip into an accent for that. Okay. The road rises a little, passing cornfields and orchards. The leaves are turning and the trees are alive with glorious reds and golds. I've just begun to doze when the driver takes a tight bend at speed. Now back to my voice. Uh, adding size and con together, then divide the total by 10 rounding down. This is my starting value for hit points. Okay, so that's how my character sheet got nine hit points. Um, <laughs> do everything in that accent. Okay, I can do that. Um, okay, we get to do our first roll. I'm excited. Um, I need to roll 3d6. Okay. Uh, and that's going to be my luck score. Okay. 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 So here we go. I've got a, we can look up close to the dice roller. I have this set up to roll d100, um, but we want to roll 2d6. So I've got to get uh, 2d6 on there. Um, so... I need roll. Let's clear my dice and we'll roll 3d6. Okay, I got nine. Oh, that's no good. Um, that's, oh my gosh. Okay, I rolled a one and two fours for a total of nine starting luck. Ugh. Okay, I'm going to clear my dice and bring my 2d10 back up. Um, there we go. That's not a real roll, unfortunately. Oh yeah, for fortunately, because that's an 85 and that's deeply upsetting. Uh, okay, but I got a nine for my starting luck. So going back to my character sheet. So luck is, um, it's both a stat and a resource. So sometimes you have to do um, luck rolls um, or, um, so just to see if you're lucky, but you can also spend luck, uh, to succeed on a role that you would otherwise fail. I am going to Im self impose the rule that you can't spend more than 10 luck on a single roll. But like, if I needed to roll, um, below, if I needed to roll a 40 or below and I rolled a 41, I could spend that one luck to go from a failure to a success. Um, okay. So I rolled that nine. Um, then we're going to multiply my 3d6 roll by five to get your beginning luck score and mark it on your investigator sheet. So nine times five is 45. So we have our starting luck. Brilliant. That's not a lot of luck to start with. I'm not sure how I feel about that. Um, <laughs> okay. Not, I'm not sure I like that um, adventure. Okay. Uh, okay. So if you remember, 
both when we started this, um, uh, the driver of my car took a turn really hard. So I am going to make a dex roll. So to do a dex roll, we're going to roll 1d100, 1d100. Um, and uh, if we roll equal to or below my dex, then I succeed. So um, we've got to see if I succeed or fail on this dex roll. So let's I uh, go back to mostly our dice roller. There we go. Um, actually, you know what? Sorry, I'll leave it on character sheet because my dex is a 60. So I need to roll at or below a 60. Um, so let's see what happens. Oh, I got a 54. So I succeed. Huzzah. Okay. 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 Maybe not terrible. <laughs> Um, okay. Uh, so I succeed. So let's jump to, uh, my successful, de successful dex roll. Go to 261. <clears throat> A desperate wet yell awakens me. I feel myself slide from the seat as the driver spins the wheel and the motor coach plunges off the road. I grab hold of the seat in front just in time to prevent a painful fall. The coach stops with a thump. Now I see what's happened. A Fordson tractor has stopped in the road and my driver had to swerve to avoid the steel obstacle. He leaps from his seat into the road, ushering a, uh, unleashing a string of curses at the farmer. I take a moment to catch my breath. Perhaps I should offer assistance? But the driver has already returned. He backs the coach up a little and threads it around the tractor, glaring at the farmer. Okay, so going to 71, I resume my journey. The driver takes the curves with more caution than before. He glances over his shoulder at me a couple of times. Sorry about that, he says. That fellow was dumber than a hog. I'm Silas. What's your name? The accident was at least as much Silas's fault as the farmer's, but it doesn't seem shrewd to antagonize the man while he's driving me through the middle of nowhere. And this is the part in character creation where <laughs> I just saw your uh, chat, Katie. Uh, you want me to read bedtime stories in that voice? I can do that. Um, and also feel like having a sundowner is appropriate for that voice. Amazing. Um, so this is where I make up a name for my character. Oh gosh, her name's totally Savannah, right? Um... I feel like Savannah is correct. So let's name her um, Savannah. Oh, what? Can you all in OBS see? Character sheet. Perfect. Okay. Savannah. I don't know. What sounds like a rich people from Georgia last name. Uh Savannah, um, <laughs> uh, I don't know. Let's go Wells. That's Savannah Wells. Let's see. Savannah Wells. There we go. That rolls off the tongue really well. Birthplace, obviously, uh, Savannah, Georgia, right? Pronouns, uh, she, her, um, re residence unknown, right? Uh, because she's moving, um, and age, let's make her, let's make her young. Let's make her like 23. Um, okay. Then we'll figure out her occupation in a bit. Cause that is also part of character creation. So call of Cthulhu doesn't have classes. They have occupations, but you can kind of make up an occupation if you want. It's a very fun it's a very fun character creation system in in my humble opinion um but okay i want to get everything set up so that i can see chat and now the thing i'm supposed to read okay so i have made up a name for my character and recorded it on my investigator sheet um and okay the coach turns onto a narrow road, which weaves uphill through woodland. Silas becomes chatty. Going to Arkham, eh? 
Can't say I ever heard of the place. Went to Boston once. Didn't like it. Too much hustle and bustle. You got family there? A special someone waiting? The afternoon is wearing on, and I see no harm in confiding in Silas about my new life. A job. I have a job waiting for me. A job, eh? What's your line? And then, out of the quick start guide, um, the available jobs are antiquarian, um, doctor of medicine, journalist, private investigator, and professor. So I'm going to go with journalist. I mentioned the reporter's job, which I secured at the Arkham Gazette on the strength of a few freelance pieces in my local newspaper. It will be a relief to get away from vapid society columns and whimsical stories. I understand that the Gazette covers everything from breakthroughs of research at Miskatonic University to the most sword, sword exploits of local ne'er-do-wells. It should be something to get my teeth into at any rate. A writer... For a newspaper, Sil Silas seems confused, as if he thought the stories somehow wrote themselves. So now I get a few more stats. Also, Dead Chicken, I only now see your chat that says Savannah Cedarwoods, and I'm going to change her name from Wells to Cedarwoods. Let me see. Savannah Cedarwoods. There, yeah, love it. Love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. So let's make this Cedarwoods. Cedar Woods, and occupation is journalist. Okay. So, now that I know I'm a journalist, that gets me, like, skills. Um, so I'm going to scroll down on this a little bit. Okay. So these are all of the things that you can do. Um, so, like, you know, first aid, history, et cetera, so forth. The numbers that are in parentheses, like this jump 20%, that is, if this is not one of your skills, everybody has a baseline of 20% in jump. So, okay. Um, so even if jump isn't one of my skills, which I doubt it's going to be, uh, I only have to roll below a 20 to succeed on a jump roll. All right, so let's see what skills a journalist gets. Okay, my occupation skills are arts and crafts, photography, history, library use, own language, psychology, and one of either charm, fast talk. Sorry, uh, Siri thought I was asking what psychology was and started talking in my head. I don't know why I have earbuds in. I don't need them um, as it, it occurs to me. Anyway, okay. Um... So I get to pick between charm, fast talk, intimidate, or persuade. I can also pick um, any two other skills except Cthulhu Mythos as personal specialties and allocate the values. Um, I have one 70, two 60s, three 50s, and two 40s. Okay, so um, I'm actually going to make a note. There. Okay, yeah, I've got that written down. Um, so let's pick those skills. So history, library use, own language. Okay. Psychology. I'm going to pick charm. History, library use, own language, psychology, charm. Okay. Um, so history, I think I'll use one of my 40s. I'm not sure she paid super close attention in history class. So I'll put a 40 here. Um, psychology, though, I think I'm going to be best at psychology. I think she's just very good at reading people. Um, so we'll do 70 in psychology. So I've used my only 70. Uh, let's see. I'll put a 50 in language own. Um, so that is going to be, uh, English. 
and I, I de she might know a little French. She knows enough French to be interesting at parties, right? But I'm not going to take that as a skill. Um, so we'll put English as a 50. Um, I bet she's also pretty good at library use. So I bet she's good at looking things up. If she kind of gets her teeth on something, I think she's going to use that a lot. So let's put... Let's put a 60 into library use. Um, let's do that. And I'm going to put my other 60 into charm because I would like a skill that lets me influence people. And she's got such a lovely Southern charm anyway, especially to those folks up north in Arkham. Um, hi, if you've never met me, I am from Oklahoma. I went to college in Boston and promptly lost my Southern accent. So Southern accents of all flavors are like the one accent that I can do <laughs> consistently. Anyway. Um, okay. So there's a charm. So I've got both my sixties. What were those other skills? <laughs> okay. I've also got... Um, history. Oh, sorry. Photography. I'm not sure she's a very good photographer. So arts and crafts, photography. We're trained in this guy. I'll put my 40 in there. She can, she can point and click, but it's not going to look like art. Uh, okay. 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 And what else? What else? What else? Um, okay, so photography, history, library use, own language, psychology, charm. Um, so I've used 70, 60, 60, 4, 5, 6. Okay, good. So I have... Oh. Brilliant. Okay, so I have two more things, um, and I get to one of them. They're both going to be 50s. So, okay, I just get to pick two more things. Um, okay, what should she be good at doing? Um, I'm actually going to say she's good with a rifle. I feel like her dad or someone in her family has like, uh, has like hunting dogs, right? I feel like this is a woman who has been hunting. Um, so let's do firearms at a fifth firearms rifle at a 50. There's also firearms like, um, handgun. And listen, if we're thinking like strategically here, we don't want to send homegirl out into the Cthulhu Missos, uh, on, on, um, uh, armed. There we go. That's the word. And, uh, let's see. Okay. I kind of want to take, yeah, we're going to take spot hidden um, that's a useful skill for a journalist, right? Uh, she needs to be able to keep an eye out for things. So we'll do spot hit um, hidden. I am metagaming gaming here a little bit because spot hidden is like perception in D and D. So if you don't have a spot hidden, you're not going to find anything and the game is going to be boring. Um, so we'll, we'll metagame enough to know, to try to give her some stats. That's going to make this game fun. Um, okay. So we've allocated all of those guys, all of her skills. Oh yeah, absolutely. She went quail hunting. That's a thing. Uh, <laughs> and okay. So what do we do next? Okay. Um, once we have allocated those, we get to go to the next bit of text. Okay. I realize Silas hasn't made a stop since the incident with the tractor. The motor coach winds its way uphill. However, my thoughts are interrupted as the road crests a ridge and, and I'm treated to a magnificent view of a vista below. A creek snakes through the valley, breaking the rich autumn palette of the tree line. In the distance, the white mountains rise into hazy cloud. 
There's no settlement, not even a cabin, as far as the eye can see. Birds drift through the treetops, and I can just make out what might be two white-tailed deer lingering by the water. Perhaps I'm making a mistake by moving to the city. Could I survive on my own in this lush wilderness? Um, okay, so this is now more mechanics. Um, uh, so I have a base ability in most skills. Uh, that's like the jump 20%. Um, <clears throat> but now I get to pick four skills that are not my occupation skills, and they also can't be Cthulhu myth Mythos. So Cthulhu Mythos is a skill that you get as you interact with the Cthulhu Mythos, and it, like, negatively impacts your sanity. So that's not a starting gameplay mechanic. So these are my personal interest skills, and what I get to do is add 20 to the base skill. So let's go pick four. Okay. So I get to pick four more skills. Um, I kind of want to pick natural world to go with that quail hunting thing. So we'll take one on that. Um, and so I get to take 20 plus that starting 10. So a total of 30. Um, let's see. Listen, that feels, that feels good. Um, that also feels like a good, I want to be a journalist. I need to listen really closely and carefully. So let's add a listen. So there's two. I could have a 40 in this one. So 40. Okay. Um, I might, oh, you know, let's give her anthropology. I feel like she took a bunch of anthropology classes in college, right? So we'll have a starting anthropology of 21. Um, okay. And so I get one more. Um, and what is that going to be? Um, let's do persuade. Persuade seems good either persuade or like first aid. Um, so the question is, was she a girl scout? I mean, I think she was way more likely to be a debutante than a girl scout. Right. Okay. So yeah, let's do persuade. Um, just leaning as far into that Southern charm as we can. Okay. Oh, not 39, 30 flat. Okay. So there's our four other skills. Excited about that. Okay. All right. And I think that's all. I think that's all in the character creation part. Okay. Let's jump to the next section. Okay. The motor coach rattles on through the hills and Silas lapses into silence. The sky darkens behind me, pinks tinting the clouds as the sun descends. Finally, a welcome sight comes into view, a settlement on the crest of a hill. This doesn't look like the pictures I've seen of Osepi, excuse me, Ossipi. But perhaps I could persuade Silas to stop while I stretch my legs. Minutes later, a harsh stuttering from the engine interrupts my reverie. Silas frowns and rattles the gear stick. The motor coach falters in its ascent. Silas utters a curse I don't recognize and grinds his teeth struggling at the wheel. We seem to inch up the hill until we reach the first buildings, low dwellings constructed from a rough red stone. Silas wrestles the coach into a small bay off the road. He scrambles from his seat and makes for the engine compartment. So now I need to roll against either drive auto or psychology. Um, I'm going to do psychology because that's one of my skills, but I have to get a hard success in psychology. Um, so let's actually take a look. Let me take a look at that character sheet. Um, so a hard success in psychology, uh, would be a 35, but a drive auto regular, um, is I'd have to get a 20. All right. So I'm more likely to make that psychology roll. Okay. 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 
You've got to roll with stakes. My goodness. Uh... Oh my gosh, that's a 28! I succeeded! Uh, sorry, I'm really excited! <laughs> I didn't think I was going to succeed because that's really low. But no, I got below that 35. Um, that's so exciting. Okay, uh, so what do I get to do? What do I get to do? Okay, um, um, if I roll a hard success against psychology, go to 162. Let's go there. Okay. I sense a falseness to Silas's actions. He's acting. Either he is not as aggravated about the breakdown as, has, as his behavior suggests, or perhaps the breakdown itself is an act. If this is ruse to make you spend your time and money in a local shop, he will sadly be disappointed in my purchasing power. Uh... <laughs> Amazing. On my investigator sheet, check mark the small box to the left of the word psychology. If you successfully complete this adventure, you have the opportunity to learn from your experience with Silas. Oh no. Okay. So on my roll on my sheet here, I was checking everything I was trained in, but I wasn't supposed to do that. Um, so let me undo that. I was just supposed to check psychology to maybe, uh, improve it. If like, if Savannah survives. So I'm going to uncheck everything. But this PDF, because it has all the calculations in it, it's it's actually a little clunky and slow. Okay. Charm, photography, anthropology. All right, I think I unchecked everything. Yeah, perfect. Except we have psychology checked, because if I survive, I might get to learn stuff. Okay, so now we're going to go to 194. Uh... Silas opens the engine compartment uh, and sticks his head inside. The hot metal pops and sizzles. He pokes at various components, then withdraws and wipes his brow, smearing it with dark grease. I ain't sure what's wrong. Might be the oil pressure. Might be something knocked off kilter when we took that spill. Can't do much until the engine cools, neither. And with the light failing, I reckon we'll be here through the night. He wipes his hands on a rag. The shadows form my surroundings are all red along, and the air is chilly. I feel stiff from the journey and a night in the rickety coach sounds unappealing. Silas sees my dismay. This here is Emberhead, miles from any place. I only come through twice a week, but the folks here are good people. May led, led better. Keeps a spare room. She'll look after you. Up that alley. Turn right. First house on the left. He scratches his cheeks. Looks again into the engine compartment and spits on the ground. Meet me back here at eight in the morning and we'll see how we stand. Okay. So I can, at this point, go look for May Ledbetter. Ask Silas where he will spend the night. I don't think Savannah cares. Um, or challenge Silas about the breakdown. I think I'm going to challenge Silas about the breakdown. That's, we know something's up. Let's honor that successful role we got a minute ago. Yeah. Okay. Let's do it. Okay. I confront Silas with my sufficient suspicions. <laughs> His brow darkens and he shows a mouthful of twisted teeth. Ain't that just like you city types, he spits. Thinking the worst of a man after he's gone out of his way, tend to your comfort. He stalks around to the back of the coach and hauls my bags from the rack, dumping them on the ground at my feet. Take them. Otherwise, I guess you'd be accusing me of thievery in the morning. He marches off into the darkness, raging. That could have gone better. I drag my cases between the sullen buildings. I feel surprisingly weary, considering I've spent all day sitting down. Silas's directions lead me to a modest dwelling with a slate roof. A nameplate reads, Leadbetter. And underneath a sign, a neat copper plate reads, Lodging Room. The lane around me is gloomy, but a lamp flickers in the window. A breeze chills my face. I'm not about to begin my new life by sleeping in the street. I rap on the weather-beaten door. 
After a moment, I hear footsteps inside the house. A bolt is drawn back and the wooden door swings open. A figure with loose curls and a rough-looking house, house dress peers at me. Her gaze takes in my traveling suit and my cases. Her voice has a slight Irish lilt. Well, let's see if Maddie knows how to do an Irish accent. Hold on, hold on. Oh, this is going to be bad. Okay. Uh, hello? Should I take it? You're looking for a room for the night? I inquire as to her rates, suppressing a grimace. As far as I've seen, the villain, the village does not offer me many alternatives. Oh, you'll find them very reasonable, she says. You look tired. I'm me. Come inside and we'll take, we'll talk over a cup of tea. The lead bed house feels cramped, with low ceiling and simple fittings. But it's well kept and, and a cheerful fire crackles in the grate. The aroma of the tea is soothing and the cup warms my fingers. Have you come to Emberhead for the festival? Asks May. <sighs> I'm glad it's not offensive. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, um, I'm going to explain to her. No, you know what? No, I'm going to ask about the festival. My two choices are explain what happened with Silas and the coach or to ask about the festival. So I think, um, I think Savannah is going to be curious. She's not super happy to be here, but uh, maybe she should at least be entertained. Maybe there's a story here. Okay. Well, now, I suppose the festival's about the only reason folks come to Emberhead. I thought you might had come maybe to study it or take photographs. Well, it's not tomorrow night, but the night after. I suppose it looks very strange to a passerby. May tops up my tea. The spout chinks against my cup. Sorry, switching between those is hard. Oh no. <laughs> um, we want the beacon, you see. One night every year, there's a torch-lit procession and we light the beacon on the cliffs. You've never seen the like of it. They say it keeps the spirit of the village alive for another year. It's a celebration. A celebration. She trails off for a moment and blinks. But you didn't come here to listen to me blather, and you must be hungry. I can rustle you up a bit of stew. How would that be? I think I'm going real hard Scottish. Oh, like, we're just drifting. We're drifting into generic British Isles. I'm very sorry. Mm -hmm. I ask again about her rates, and May names a price so low I accept it without hesitation. The room is small but comfortable, and the stew dark and hearty. After dinner, I have a couple hours before my usual bedtime. To talk to May some more, go to 31. To walk around and get my bearings, go to 75. To turn in for an early night, go to 63. Who's going to turn in for an early night? That sounds boring. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I, Maddie, don't want to talk to May anymore because I don't want to have to keep doing that accent. So let's walk around and get our bearings. That sounds fun. Okay. Mm -hmm. May's bra... <laughs> Mm, God. May's brow creases when I announce my intention to take a stroll. Mind how you go, she says. Emberhead's surrounded by cliffs and we don't have your fancy street lamps here. Take the lantern and watch your step. Outside, I see what she means. The sky is overcast and only a few glimmers of moonlight peek from the clouds. Without the heavy lantern, I would be walking into near total darkness. I can't hope to get an overview of the village tonight. May's street is a narrow passage hemmed by squat, dark dwellings. At the end, however, it opens up. A wide thoroughfare leads off to my right. A crude sign names it Silbury Street. To the left, a few yards away, my light picks out the crooked posts of a simple fence. And beyond that, the ground drops away into darkness. I take a t couple of steps closer, but can see nothing. Air from below cools my feet. Then some instinct makes you look, makes me look around. That that sounds ominous. So I'm gonna use my very fun light trick. Uh, 
an ink-black figure stands in the road, about twenty yards behind me. It stares at me. I form the sudden impression that it will run at me and, and throw me over the cliff edge. The, uh, seeing it has been spotted, the figure slips down the alley. Uh, I'm going to go confront that dark figure. A as I approach, the figure takes a pace back, then another. It, it slips down the alley between two buildings. Okay, to catch your target, you must make a track roll. If I succeed... Uh, go to 141. If I fail, go to 130. So let's make a track roll. Uh, I am not trained in track, so I've got to get below 10. This is... an extra does go work? But we'll find out. Oh, I'm still on the dice roller. Okay. Uh, uh, okay, a 10. That's what we've got to get. That's what we've got to get on our dice. So... Oh, a 72. Absolutely not. Um... Well, that's a failure. I don't get to follow the mysterious figure. Okay. <sighs> the figure moves fast, with almost silent steps. I'm hampered with, with the heavy lantern in an unfamiliar environment. I emerge from the alley into a dusty courtyard and, and can, te can detect no sign of my quarry. I scratch around for a few minutes, but the, the figure has gone. It seems unwise to continue my stroll through unknown dark streets while this threatening presence is abroad. I head back to the Leadbed house, Leadbed house. May lets me in and settles back into her chair. Soon she begins to yawn. I believe I'll turn in. When would you like your breakfast? As May stands, I hear a clunk behind me. I look over my shoulder, but all I can see is a wooden door, securely closed. May tuts. The young lady of the house. She'll have been listening to us. Ruth, come and greet our guest. There's a short pause, then the door creaks open. Two wide eyes peer at me from the gap, between tousled hair and a rough nightgown. What do you say? The eyes, the eyes blank. Pleased to meet you. Now get back to bed. The door closes again. My daughter Ruth. Ten years this summer. She's a delight and a torment all in one. Don't worry, she sleeps in with me. She'll not disturb you. Good night now. I retire to my room. It's a little chilly, but I'm too tired to worry about lighting the fire. The sheets are clean and the bed soon warms up. The silence outside is strange after living in town for so long, but... I soon drop off. I dream of fire in the grate, corsicating colors shimmering through the dancing tongues of flame. At first they're tiny, almost microscopic, but they grow and grow until a kaleidoscope inferno spills from the fireplace, spreading across the floor, up the sheets. I wake with a start. Daylight glints through the curtains. I get up and examine the great blinking sleep from my eyes. It, it's quite cold. Uh, but there's nothing. May seems to have no run in water, but has supplied some in a ceramic jug. I freshen up at the washstand and, and go on it. She cooks a hearted breakfast uh, and leaves me in peace to eat. At about 7.30, I'm paid up, packed, and ready to go. I bid May goodbye, and she wishes me the best for my new career in Arkham. Okay, there's a there's a little prompt here. That's if you succeeded a skill roll last night and wish to investigate further, go to 178. I'm like, no, I wish I'd succeeded a skill roll. But okay, we'll have to do the otherwise. Mm. I'm already tired of my heavy bags. Hopefully Silas has repaired the motor coach and we can resume our long journey. A sourpuss he might be, but the old driver seemed to understand his vehicle well enough. I pause to check my watch, still 20 minutes early, and round the final corner. The motor coach is gone. 
I put my bags down and searched the area, trekking up and down slopes and round corners. At the edge of the village, I, I traced the long road back as it winds across the hills. Eight o'clock comes and goes, and there's no coach to be seen. A passing villager notices my bags. Looking for the bus? I heard him take off at first light. He's due back in three or four days. If you need a place to stay, May rents a room. The man raises his hat to me and strolls on into the village. I curse Silas under my breath. Perhaps he went for pots, but I wonder if the old goat had stranded me here on purpose. May is doing laundry and looks surprised to see me again. Forgot something? When I explain the situation, she offers to store my bags while I try to arrange alternative transportation. I am grateful to relinquish the load. Nobody has anything like a car. She strokes, she strokes a chin and there's right. Oh my gosh! Sorry, that I just that was all, that was all messed up. All right, May is gonna be the death of me. Okay, um, she strokes a chin and narrows her eyes. Maybe you could find somebody with a horse and a cart for your bags. I could ask around later. Try Mister Winters at the village hall. He'll know if anyone will or. Ask among the artisans. Their workshops are first left on Silbury Street. She reaches over and squeezes my wrist. Don't worry, I won't let you sleep, see you sleeping in the street, money or none. I thank May and turn to face the village. I wander the streets of Emberhead without any particular direction in mind. The village is built on relatively flat upland with splendid views. To the north, the hazy tips of the white mountains reach for the heavens. To the south, the sparkling waters of Lake Winnipesaukee touch the horizon. The village itself takes less than five minutes to cross from edge to edge. I arrived on the winding road to the west. The only other road leaves from the south, following a lower ridge of land as it turns east. In the southwest of the village... An open grassy space borders a ruined church, its graveyard cresting the cliffs. To the northeast, the three main thoroughfares meet at a black metal structure. It looms stark against the blue sky. Okay, now I get to ask about transportation at the local general store, uh, seek out the village hall, walk down to the lower level and check out the eastern road, Examine the mar large metal structure. Uh, explore the church or look for local people with their own transport needs. I think I will go to the general store. <coughs> mm. Ah. There we go. The general store is on a corner behind, beside the main road, just before it plunges to the south. The shopkeeper is brisk, a mince lady with a starched apron and strong shoulders. She looks hard at my unfamiliar face. Transport? There's a motor coach comes through twice a week. Missed it? Hmm. Truck brings in my supplies every second Tuesday, but he's not due until next week. She shrugs. It seems Emberhead is content to keep its distance from the outside world. Okay, I have enough money to buy one or two inexpensive everyday items here. Um, the shop stocks no weapons except a dusty hunting knife. So I don't think she needs to buy anything. Um... I mean, maybe a flashlight. I'll put a flashlight down. Um, but other than that, I don't think it would occur to her. Okay. Okay. I'm beginning to get my bearings in the head. Would I like to so explore some more? Um, so, okay, I can choose from another option. I think... Savannah is kind of like, I don't think she's used to having to figure out her own logistics, right? So I think 
um, she's going to be a little more interested and in, like, well, I guess I'm stuck here until the coach arrives. Uh, maybe I can discover something cool. Right. Um, I, I think she probably thinks she's stuck for at least a week. So, <coughs> sorry, goodness. Okay. Should have brought tea instead of, no, I, wine was the correct choice, even if it's not the best for my throat. Right. Okay. So I think, I think she's going to examine that large metal structure. Cause that was weird. Um, I think, so I think she's just going to go explore. Let's go do that. Okay. I walk up the approach, the most central of the village's major streets. It points directly at the odd metal structure. As I emerge from the shade of the nearby buildings, I'm greeted by a magnificent panorama spread from the north to the southeast. The last colors of fall tint the hills in a sleepy gold. The structure, by contrast, is made from uncompromising iron, singed black. It supports an immense curved platform at the level of my head. Further struts snake up to a central point. It looks like it may have been some kind of sculpture at one time, but are now twisted and melted beyond recognition. An older gentleman passes, looking up at me with room eyes. Are you looking for the festival? He asks. That's the beacon. When they light it, night after next, you'll be able to see it ten miles away. He gives a little nod of satisfaction, then moves on, leaving, leaning on his walking stick. Now I notice bundles of wood tied against and stacked against buildings nearby. Perhaps the festival will be an interesting diversion, but I really must head to Arkham as soon as possible. So now I'm going to make a spot hidden roll. So we will see if I succeed. Okay. So spot hidden. I think I have a 50 in that. Oh, that's a 93. That is so bad. Oof. Well, I definitely don't succeed at that. I, Maddie, am already getting nervous that, like, if I don't roll better, she's going to fall off a cliff and die, just like my physicist. Okay. Um, we're going to go to 25. Oh, this brings me back to, uh, uh, I can keep exploring. Um, so, uh, we have gone to the general store, to the large metal structure, um, and then I get to pick up to four things, uh, to explore. So I am going to explore the church. Why not? That sounds like a nice thing to do. Early morning walk. Okay. I cross the street towards the church. As I glance to my left, my gaze alights on the large metal structure. Something bothers me about its positioning. I back up and look again. Yes. Ember's central thoroughfare points directly at the structure. This seems too precise to be a coincidence. I press on and draw into the shadow of the church. The building is in a sorry state. The top of the steeple is missing, a ragged gash of splintered boards my, make, marking its absence, and the floors beneath it have collapsed. It appears to have torn through the roof of the main building as it fell. Only the back half is still intact. The white paint, which once covered the church, has yellowed and peeled. It seems safe enough to explore the rear section. Old pews are stacked against the wall, choked with mildew. Most of the windows are broken. I guess this church has been disused for about 20 years. There's little more to interest me. Uh, okay, I gotta make a ride roll with advantage okay uh okay okay i don't think i have anything in ride um no so i have to get a five <laughs> so let's see if we can get below a five well that's a 99 but i get a roll with advantage so let's try again and an 81 failed that roll 
Yeah. Okay. One more place to explore. Okay. Um, one more place. Uh, here, I'll scroll up on this for y'all. Okay. Um, all right. So I can go to the village hall or check out the Eastern Road. Let's go to the village hall. I feel like Savannah would want to be around people. She's a people person. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Okay. The village hall backs against a cliff at the east end of Silbury Street. It's the largest building I've seen so far in Emberhead. It is, however, locked and shuttered. I walk around it, peering through gaps in the shutters. There seems to be one large room, presumably for community meetings, and a, and a smaller annex which serves as an office and an archive. One of the windows is bricked up. But back at the main door, I can see no posted opening hours. Meh, Mrs. Rewinters doesn't open up mornings this time of year, says a gray-gobbed woman passing by. Best come back this afternoon. I ask whether the office has a telegraph. Don't know, she shrugs. Who would we call? I'll have to try again later. Okay, that's as much as I can explore. Uh, so what happens next? My morning excursions have left me hungry. I roam the streets of Emberhead looking for sustenance. There's nothing resembling the busy cafes of Savannah or anything that might be called a restaurant. It's beginning to look like I'll have to get supplies from the general store when May Ledbetter comes down the street with a girl trailing in her wake. This must be Ruth. As she notices me, she races past her mother and approaches me with a smile. This is a different Ruth from the shy creature of last night. As she reaches me, she stops and stretches her arms up in celebration. She looks up into my eyes. Abruptly, the smile drops from her face and she looks several years older. Get out before the festival, she hisses. Get out. She blinks hard, then scuttles back towards her mother. May approaches, wrapping an arm around her daughter's shoulders. She smiles. How are you getting on? Have you found transport? Startled, I explain the frustrations of the situation. I'd try Mr. Winters in the village hall. He's always in of afternoon. You'll be hungry by now. Help yourself to any food in the house. The door's not locked. I glance at, I glance at Ruth, where she squirled herself behind her mother's leg. Her eyes implore me to silence. So I can either ask Ruth about what she said, ask May about what Ruth said, or say nothing. Oh, I'm going to be terrible and ask Ruth about what she said. I crouch down and ask Ruth what she meant. It's scary at the festival, Ruth, Ruth says. It's bright and hot and the flames go all over. Her face and voice are both childlike. The abrupt shift is disturbing. I suppose all children do unfathomable things. May rolls her eyes and tossles her daughter's hair. Ruth looks at the ground. I take my leave of the Ledbetters and head towards their home. The door opens easily. In the low kitchen, I make a meal from stodgy bread and leftover stew. A little window offers a view of the mountains. If I learned one thing this morning, it was that Emberhead's streets hold little to occupy the visitor from out of town, but there are still five hours of daylight remaining. I could take some provisions and the bare essentials from my luggage and set out in hope of reaching another settlement before dark, or I could ask advice from Mr. Winters. There is no way Savannah is going to go hiking, uh, so she's going to go to the village hall instead. 
The village hall overlooks the north ridge of the village. I walk along Silberry Street to find it, because I've been there this morning, conscious of the oppressive black metal structure framed at the end of the road. The shutters of the hall are open and some windows left ajar. There's no knocker, but a little bell over the entrance tinkles as I push the front door. Inside, a studded door to my right is marked private. To my left, an opening leads through to a bright room. I take a few steps inside. Benches line the walls and there are two notice boards mounted between the windows. Um, I'm going to examine the notice boards. The floorboards creak beneath me as I cross the room. I feel a slight spring in my step. Perhaps this room is used as a gymnasium for the village children. One notice board appears to be for adults of the community and one for children. The former looks neglected, featuring handwritten advertisements for household items and a yellow note about telegraph pricing. There's nothing about the festival. The children's notice board has a schedule for weekly services and a number of paintings obviously done by the children themselves. Most are incoherent, though colorful. As best as I can tell, they depict fireworks or perhaps the tale of Joseph from the good book. One has lost a pen and hangs upside down. It shows a giant bird attacking Emberhead. Or it might simply be that the artist had not yet mastered the subtleties of scale. So now now I've got a spot hidden roll again. Um... So, okay, so my spot hidden is, uh, what is my spot hidden? Okay, my spot hidden is 50, so 50, 50 odds here, team. Let's see if I can get, oh my goodness, that's a 73! I can't, I can't succeed, I'm going to die. This is, this isn't gonna be good at all. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Uh. <coughs> Sorry, that screen is weird. Let me fix my OBS, I think. Oh. No, that's right. Okay. Oh, jeez. Okay. Well, I failed that. Ugh. The door scrapes behind me. A middle-aged, bespectacled, bespectacled gentleman appears in the doorway. May I help you? I'm visiting on May Ledbetter's recommendation. Ah, well, I'm Clyde Winters. I'm not sure I can help you, but would you care for some coffee? I'm partial to a cup in the afternoon. I th <laughs> Thank you, sir. That'd be lovely. He gestures to the open door behind him. It's a worthwhile opportunity, and a cup of coffee would be lovely. I step through the doorway marked private. The other side of the village hall is marked contrast to the public space. The room is compact, lined with shelves of books and file alcoves. alcoves. One corner is reserved for a tiny pantry and what is presumably a water closet. I study Mr. Winters as he fills the percolator. Although thin on top, his hair is oiled and neatly swept back. His suit is a sober affair, and well tailored even if the cut is a little old-fashioned. A lesser man working alone might have loosened his bow tie for comfort. On the desk against the opposite wall, I notice what looks like a telegraph set. I can either ask about the telegraph immediately or make small talk with Mr. Winters. She's going to make small talk because she is a polite Southern lady. The pot begins to gurgle as we exchange pleasantries. Living here? It's a trade-off, like so much in life. He looks past me at a hash shelf. I could wish for access to a proper library, of course, but I know myself well enough. I'm strictly a dabbler, and the city's... His face wrinkles in distaste. Too many people. Everybody rushing and shouting. We have a special place here in Emberhead. And someone must accept responsibility for keeping it so. That was my father before me, and now the duty falls to me. He lifts his chin and straightens up. 
This evening, as the sun sets, look out at the landscape around the village. We have peace up here, halfway to the stars. Is that not worth the hardships we must accept? He looks at me speculatively, this, and I ask about the telegraph. The telegraph? Hmm. Much as we value our isolation, we do need the link sometimes. Were you hoping to send a message? I have to apologize. The line's been down for two weeks. I reported the fault, but of course they're not so speedy when the problem lies in a rural area. I'm expecting the repair the day after next. I do appreciate how frustrating this must be. The coach is due in, what, three days? But I think he's going west. Maybe you could engage a wagon? One of the farmers... I've asked a few of the residents already to no avail. I'll tell you what. Winters pours me a steaming cup of coffee. The dark liquid smells rich and strong. When the repair crew arrive, I'll ask them to take you back with them. How would that be? They might want a dollar or two to grease the wheels. The day after tomorrow? Well, that's less than ideal, but it's the first real opportunity. Um, and I would like to ask him about his library. I can either thank him and go or continue chatting. So I'm going to ask him about his library. Mm. Those books on your shelves are, are lovely. Uh, you said something about wishing you had access to a proper library, but what do you have here? Winters blushes with pleasure. Well, of course, they're not my personal collection. They belong to the village, he says. But I did select most of the recent items. The, this is the community library, you see. I put up the private sign to stop people from just wandering in from meetings in the other room, but this is really a public space. Uh, I scan the shelves. There is a sparse but respectable collection on mathematics and the sciences, passable sections on history and arts, and a shelf on literature. He has a, long, a few low brown novels tucked away in a corner with tatty copies of Bizarre Tales magazine. Quality doesn't always equal uh, popularity, I'm afraid. Winters gives me an apologetic smile. I'm gonna, so I can either take the time for some research in the library or leave while it's still light outside. I'm gonna take some time for some research. Why not? Um, Winters is happy for me to spend the rest of the afternoon in study and offers me an upright but comfortable chair. I have enough time to peruse one line of research in depth. So I can either read about the history of the area, read about the festival, read something from the sciences, or read some of the weird fiction. I am reading about that festival. <sighs> okay. I'm not surprised to find there is no published works on Imbahead's festival. Winters pokes around and finds a cased monograph, handwritten on yellowing paper by a Dr. Anilowski. An acquaintance of my father's, I believe, Winters says. The manuscript is somewhat difficult to read, and I make slow progress. Anilowski speculates that the festival has its origin in pagan rats brought over by uh, Celtic settlers which celebrate the ancient festivals of Beltane, Sem, Huen, Imbolc, and... Uh, can't pronounce that next one. Lugansad? There's some discussion of the struggle between the seasons and a couple of oblique references to the alignment in Imbahed. Anilowski suggests that the meaning of the festival slowly changed around the turn of the century. The monograph terminates mid-sentence at the end of page 28, just as it begins to discuss modern practices. I ask Winters if, if he has the remaining pages, but he says they've been misplaced. Perhaps they're still in the library somewhere, but he shrugs. Oh, excuse me, Sam Heiner Sowen. Okay, I must make time for a thorough stock take. Oh, I don't like those missing pages. I don't like that at all. Okay. Uh, the afternoon wears on, and I've not quite finished my reading when Winters glances out the window and stands up. He clears his throat. 
So I'm going to make a credit rating roll. My credit rating is... Um, I forgot to allocate something to credit rating. Good job, me. Um, so I think I've got to put a 40 in there. Yep, credit rating 40. There we go. Okay. So let's see if I can succeed on a credit rating roll. Nine! Oh my gosh, I succeeded on a roll. Huh. Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe something will happen. Oh my goodness. Okay, okay. So I succeed. I'm happy to leave you in charge for half an hour or so. He smiles. Please don't issue any books without a valid library card. Well, thank you for your trust, Mr. Winters. I'll sit here and continue reading for a time. Um, as the light dims, I find myself yawning in the closeness of the room. Perhaps it's time for a change of material. Okay, I get to make a spot hidden roll. Um, so my spot hidden is not bad. My spot hidden is like 50. Um, yeah, yeah. So I got a 50-50 chance of succeeding this one. So let's, let's see. Let's see if I can succeed at a roll. That's... No! Why can I, like, not roll below a 70? Jeez. Okay. Ugh. Okay, 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 okay. Well. Failed that. Jeez. Ugh. The door opens and Winters re-enters the library. He wears a small, satisfied smile. His gaze shifts to where I stand at the shelves. Exhausted our stock already? Of course we accept donations. He chuckles. I'm afraid it's closing time. I leave the building with Winters and wait as he locks up. I thank him for the coffee and access to the library. He strolls away down Silbury Street. As the lap fades, I return to the Ledbed house and eat a lap supper. May is unusually taciturn. Ruth's eyes flicked mine several times during the meal. There's an urgency there I can't quite interpret. Afterwards, May ushers the girl into their room. I've been an emberhead for barely one whole day, and I ought to feel confined by it, both geographically and socially. The evening seems to offer little. Um, so I can do some stargazing or attempt to speak to Ruth. I'm going to try to talk to Ruth. In time, May returns to the kitchen and busies herself clearing up. To speak to Ruth, I will need to get May to leave for a short while. I help with the dishes and try to think of some ruse. In time, an idea comes and I ask about Silas and his friends in the village. May narrows her eyes. He knows Troy on the other side of town, she says. Not sure I'd call them friends. More like an old feuding couple. But he probably spent last night at Troy's place. I ask May if she could visit Troy and ask if Silas mentioned any plans to return. May looks dubious. Right now, she asks. Okay. Uh, without looking at my character sheet, uh, decide how to best influence May. Um, I'm gonna charm. Uh... I'm going to try to charm her. I can charm, persuade, or fast talk. So, let's charm. Uh, uh, okay, I've got a 60 in charm. I've got a 60 in charm. Come on. Oh my god, that's a four. Okay, okay. That is, that is, by the way, team, that is an extreme success. So if I had um, a keeper... Ray, I would probably get extra stuff, but I don't have a keeper. So we just count that as a regular success. But that's an excellent roll. And, okay. Okay. Oh, let's see. How is she going to charm May? Oh, please. I'd appreciate it ever so much. I think that's all she's got to do. That's her. That's I just got to be charming. Okay. Ha. Huh. I suppose it'll only take a few minutes. May fetches a coat and heads out into the night. I give a time to get clear, then rap on the bedroom door. Nothing comes but silence. 
Then feet pound on the floor and open the door a few inches. Ruth's eyes stare through the gap, glancing from left to right. I explain her mother has left the house and, and ask what's been bothering her. Those eyes flick up to stare at me. It's tomorrow, she whispers. Same as every year. They, they took my da. They'll take you if you let them. The conviction in her eyes is chilling. I press her. Who, who are you talking about? All of them. Every one. They've been watching since you got here. You're marked. Her voice was hollow. One year when I'm older, they'll take me. I hear footsteps approaching from outside. Ruth's eyes flash at the bedroom, and the bedroom door slams. I, I turn back to dry in the dishes. May enters and removes her coat. That man is a waste of time. That man's a waste of time, she hisses, and heads through to the bedroom. Ugh, I get a check mark charm, so if I survive, I can maybe improve it. Okay. I just, I have to survive. I have to survive for that to be useful. Okay. Uh. <laughs> now what do I do? Okay. The familiar surroundings of my guest room are becoming constrictive. The neat bed, small wardrobe, and dressing mirror have the feel of a prison cell about them. What am I still doing here? I, I lie on the bed and stare at a small crack in the ceiling and turn over the day's events, thinking through the little details I spotted. I'm certainly weary from the elevation and the fresh air, but do I feel safe here? Uh, absolutely not, and I do not let myself fall asleep. I will stay awake and go to 2.30. Sleep presses down on me. I, I blink it back and sit up, trying to think through my situation. Everything in Emberhead seems to be working to stop me from leaving. Perhaps the answer is to strike out at first light, to walk as fast as far and far as I can. I can always return for possessions, and if I lose them, I've nothing so precious it can't be replaced. A tiny creak draws my attention to the other side of the room. Slowly, almost silently, the, the doorknob is turning. I can grab it and wrench the door open, or pretend to be asleep. We're going to use deception. We're going to pretend to be asleep. Let's do that. Let's do that. I slide onto the bed and lie on my side, eyes closed. The hinges creak as the door opens. There's a long pause. A footfall sounds inside the room, then another. The steps are careful and feminine. I, I give it a moment and open one eye a crack. May crouches with her back to you. She's fiddling with something in the fireplace. I'm gonna wait and see what happens. After a few moments, May glances round at me. Then I hear the soft scratch of a match being lit. She applies it to something on the grate and tiptoes from the room. Once I hear her bedroom door, I creep to the gate. A small mound of black powder, no bigger than a thimble, is burning there. It gives off heady fumes. Ooh. I have to make a hard science in botany roll. <coughs> Uh, so let's see. Okay, I don't have anything in science, so I have to hit a one. That's the only, only thing I can do. So there's no way that's going to happen, but we'll roll anyway. No, an 18. That's a great roll, but I would have to get a one. So, because Savannah does not know anything about science. Um, okay. So, uh, I am going to extinguish the powder. Absolutely. So I can either extinguish the powder and and go to sleep or stay awake through the night or relax and breathe in the fumes out of curiosity. Nope, nope, nope. I'm going to stay awake through the night is what I'm going to do. I stay out the window and watch as the sun reaches the horizon, bathing the village in sickly orange. 
Uh, it's been a long night and I feel stiff and irritable. I rub my eyes and a few minutes later I hear May bustling in the kitchen. Then the front door opens and closes. Uh, okay. I get to make a con roll with advantage. Okay. Okay. So let's do... Let's do that. What is my con? My con is... Please scroll. My con's a 50. Okay. So, uh, statistically, I should be able to succeed at a con roll with advantage. A 7! Brilliant! That's a great roll! I succeed that con roll, so that's great. Um, uh, okay. So what do I do next? Um, oh, sorry, I read that wrong. Uh, I had to make a con roll. If I fail, all of my skill rolls today would suffer a penalty. I would have to roll all of my skill checks with disadvantage today. But I only rolled that con roll once, so that's fine. Okay, cool. But I succeeded on it, so I don't have to deal with that. Ah, uh, okay. The lead better kitchen is empty, although bread and eggs have been laid out for my breakfast. There's a note from May explaining that she's taken Ruth out for a few hours. If I was involved in a fight in the village last night and want to investigate the aftermath, go to 70, otherwise go to 78. How did I get to be involved? I guess I had to go stargazing to be involved in a... Uh, mate, I don't know. Okay. Okay. Uh... Whew. I make a quiet circuit of the village, pausing in unobtrusive places to watch the villagers. It's rather busy for this time of the morning. Yawn and locals stream back and forth along the roads, carrying bundles of split logs to the site of what I'd heard referred to as the beacon. I see two figures already up in its superstructure arranging the wood. The festival bonfire will be most impressive, but do I intend to stay to see it? I suspect there's something amiss here. While the villagers are distracted, I, I can do some illicit investigation. Or I could simply leave town without looking back. So do I want to search May Ledbetter's bedroom, go back to the village hall, take a closer look at the artisan's courtyard, spy on activity at the beacon, or slip down the east road and flee for good? I want to search May's bedroom. I'm worried, like, I'm worried about Ruth. Um, I probably should spy on activity at the beacon, but we're going to go investigate May's bedroom. Okay. Despite her hospitality, I don't trust May Ledbetter. I return to her house quite openly. Where else would I go? Inside the dwelling is still empty. I rap on the bedroom door and wait. Silence. I ease it open. The Ledbetter bedroom is marked contrast from my own neat space. Dirty clothes are piled on the floor. On a rough quilt lie school books and cheap novels. I notice a raggedy old doll discarded down the side of the bed. So make a spot hidden roll. Um, okay, my spot hidden is not bad. It's it's fifty. So let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Let's see. Oh, that's an eighty-two. Jeez. Okay. Ooh. Ugh, okay. <sighs> I go through the lead bedder's drawers. The only item is of interest I find is a wedding photograph. May's husband was a wiry man with a square chin. Despite the formality of the pose, I, I can see the affection between them. I feel a pang of guilt at my intrusion. Also, May could return at any, any time. Okay, if I want to push the spot hidden roll, make the roll again, and I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. I'm going to push the roll. Okay. Sorry, I didn't know they had a push roll here in the solo games. Um, so I'm very excited that I get to do that. So let's push it. 
Let's roll for spot hidden. Just, just 50 or lower. Oh my god, that's a 98! Oh no! Oh no, that's so bad! Ooh, okay. Oh dear. Oh, the, wow, that went Minnesota. Okay, okay. I failed that! Oh. Oh. A shadow falls across me. So, Mayled better says, you know, I try to get to my feet. A mob of villagers spills from behind her and surrounds me. I struggle but cannot resist the sheer weight of the numbers. I'm quickly overpowered. The fading light from a narrow window tells me the afternoon is given away to evening. My hands are shackled behind my back. I, I cannot even lie down on the rough bed. A woman I have not seen before comes in. Her face is wrinkled and her eyes dull. They don't meet mine. But she puts a cup to my lips. To accept the drink, go to 104. To reject it, go to 113. I don't know what to do. Uh, I feel like if I accept it, it's going to drug me and I'm going to die. I think that's what's going to happen. Um, so I'm not going to drink it. I'm not going to drink it. They already tried to drug me with the the, ga the stuff in the fire. Nope. Okay. Uh, I turn my face away, and when she tries again, I, I dash the cup from her hands using the side of my head. The clean liquid spills across the floor. The woman gives a half shrug and turns to leave the room. I, I shout after her, but she gives no reaction. I soon become thirsty. As the light fades outside, my, my little prison becomes dark. I can hear much activity around the building. O occasionally, an orange glow passes the window. The only comfortable position in the small plateau facing a dark sky. Wait, sorry. I know how to read. The only comfortable position... In the shackle seems to be to sit against the end of the bed with my arms hanging behind me. I need to concentrate and come up with a plan. There's no escape from my bonds. I don't know exactly what my captors want from me, but I, I can't ignore the fact that they spent the entire day constructing a massive bonfire. The door scrapes, wrenching me back into the moment. Orange light spills into the house from blazing torches held at the threshold. Two large villagers step in and grab me. At least, I, I think they're villagers. They wear heavy black cloaks, and their faces and hands are painted entirely black, save only for a red triangle centered on their left eye. I try to drag my legs, but they reach under my arms and lift me bodily from the bed. Outside, it, it seems that the whole village has congregated to see me. Every single one has a blackened face with the red triangle motif. Torches sputter and spill fire. I, I struggle, but can see the physical resistance is hopeless. I march to the central street, street and turn to face the beacon. The procession down the approach is slow and formal, save when I sense weakness and yank at my captors. A, a chill touches me when I, I see three human shapes carried ahead of me, draped in red cloth. The beacon looms larger and larger in its dreadful silhouette. A black triangle points into the stars. A low drone begins among the cloaked figures. Unbidden, the word, the word mourners comes to mind. Smoke from their torches makes me cough and I feel heat on my face. I, I reach the cleared area around the beacon. Three dancers break from the pack. Young girls swinging balls of fire and spectacular ox drawn circles in the night air. One by one, they draw close to me and touch my forehead with sooty fingers. Each kisses me three times on the left cheek, right cheek, and forehead. They whisper in my ear. The smell of kerosene fills my nostrils. And now I have to wake a roll? Make an appearance roll? Okay. Oh my goodness. 
Uh, yeah. Okay, I have a 60 in appearance. So, uh, let's see what happens. 36. Okay, okay, okay. I succeeded. I succeeded at something. Oh. Whew. Okay. <sighs> Through your sacrifice, the village will be reborn, says the first dancer. You pass from earth to air for all our sakes, says the second. I've weakened the chains, says the third. Don't try to escape until the flames are high enough to hide you. I stare at the third dancer. In that inky visage, I clearly discern the frightened features of Ruth Ledbetter. Their dance weaves off and disappears behind the buildings. I arrive beneath the beacon. Ten villagers close in on me. Working with surprising coordination, they immobilize me and lift me up the blackened iron stairs to the raised platform. I cannot help but shiver at the sight of the central fl framework, twisted from past blazes and what I can now clearly see to be fastening points for chain. None of the eyes meet mine as they lash me to the metal. The village sings now, something rhythmic and ancient, Carved from old syllables, a second group ascends to the beacon, carrying the three red-draped bodies. With reverence, they arrange their burdens in a triangle around my feet. Then they withdraw, leaving me alone with the dead, shin deep in a sea of kindling. It seems the entire village is gathering around the beacon to watch me burn. Behind the face paint, I recognized May Ledbetter. And yes, that is Silas, the coach driver, standing at her side. The audacity and scale of the deception staggers me. A man steps up on a dais and raises his hands with quiet authority. The frame of his spectacles obscures the red triangle on his face. So we draw here to... Sorry, that's him talking. So we draw here together again on this night, as we do each year, and we give thanks to the one who will preserve the village against the fire of the void. You will be taken by the ones from above in our stead. Your death will bring life to our streets and bounty to our fields. It will safeguard our children and our elders alike for another year. We salute you. He bows his head. All around the beacon, bearers step forward and lift their torches to the edge of the raised platform. A, tiny, a ring of tiny flames flicker up around the perimeter. As they wink, the singing of the villagers drops into an unearthly rhythm. So I can throw all my remaining strength against the bonds or wait and see what happens. Jeez, I need some more wine. Hold on. Okay, uh, I'm actually going to wait, and I know that's dumb, but here's why. Ruth told me to wait until the flames could hide me, and right now they're tiny flames, so I, I don't, I don't think I should try to run yet. I think I need to be hidden. Okay, so let's do it, let's do it, let's do it. The flames around the kindling catching and rising. The flames snake around the kindling, catching and rising. Smoke rises and it becomes difficult to see the villagers. The three bodies surround me catch fire, blazing with sooty red flames. I begin to cough as the smoke enters my lungs and fight down the urge to panic. If I learned a strange chant and wish to try it, this is the moment. Thanks, text. Otherwise, go to 65. Let's do that. <sighs> Flames lick at my legs. My eyes water. I'm surround shrouded in smoke. It might be my imagination, but I think I can feel a slight give in the chains. I throw myself against them, giving no thought as th uh, to how they bite into my wrists. 
I'm going to take 1d6 hit points of damage from the fire. Um, okay, so let's go. Let's go to my dice roller. And I need to... Uh, I need to clear my dice. And I need to roll a d6. Well, that's a four. Great. Love that. Love that. Uh, okay. Um... Okay, so let me mark down my hit points. Whew. Okay, uh, so I lose four. I am down to five hit points. Okay. Uh, if this reduces me to zero, I collapse and am burned to death, but I am not. Um, uh, so otherwise, make a strength roll. All right, what is my strength? My strength is 50. My strength is 50. This maybe will work. Okay, 50-50 odds, but a prob why did that roll a d8? I don't know. Let's uh, clear all those dice, and let's roll a d100. Below 50, below 50, below 50, below 50. That's a four. That's a four. We succeeded our strength roll, bitches. Okay, 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 okay. Um, yeah. Jeez, okay. Um, uh, phew, I succeed. I get to go to 93. Okay. Oh. <sighs> Good God. Okay. Desperation lends me strength. And, and I yank at what I guess to be the weak point in the chain. It breaks. I throw off the chain, stumbling across the red shrouded corpses, heading away from the watching villages. I, I cough, my hair and eyebrows smoldering. I take another 1d6 hit points of damage. So... I, this could kill me, so I have to roll, roll below a five. I have to roll below a five. Um, uh, jeez. Okay, let's roll 1d6. Please roll low, please roll low. No! No! Oh no, if this reduces you to zero, I collapse and am burned to death. The end. Oh no! Oh, jeez. Well, team. Well. Whew. Well, that was alone against the flames. <laughs> Sweet Savannah burns to death. Um, but at least I got, f gosh, I got farther in this than I did with my physicist, who again, fell off a cliff and died. Um, so... So, so Savannah died. Um, uh, probably the next time I do a stream, I, I do a Call of Cthulhu stream because this I plan on this being a kind of a, a, a ongoing thing. Um, I'll have to be someone else. Um, I'll have to be someone else. Maybe I'll be Savannah's sister. I like that. I like, let's be Savannah's sister next time so I can keep with the comforting accent. Um, and, uh, uh, oh, I'm glad you got to witness my horrible, horrible demise there. Um, so you guys are lovely. Uh, thank you so much for hanging out. If you didn't catch it, check out the VOD. Um, let me know if you liked it. Um, if there's changes you'd like to see, that kind of thing. I'll take off the ominous, ominous lighting. Um, but other than that, thank you so much for hanging out. That was actually really fun. I just kind of had to, like, I had a lot of feelings there at the end because she was dying horribly. Um, uh, but you guys are awesome. Thank you so much for hanging out. Uh, and uh, remember that it is dangerous to go alone. So good night, everybody. Have a great Thursday.